my fellow friend loves and sovereign thinker. This is LL3's newest podcast. My name is Craig. Transmitting from the beautiful swampy mangroves of South Florida. And today's date is Saturday, January 14th, 2017. Yep, Martin Luther King weekend. So you pay homage to one of the men that fought for what was right. So I remember reading a newspaper article about some rough edges he had. It was supposed to release his files this year, as I remember. I was reading this newspaper a long time ago. I was in 89 on the road. It was called uh, The Truth at Last, which was a Ku Klux Klan newspaper, by the way. I'm not going to be wrong. I read their stuff. I'm not really too keen on other areas in there, but some of the information was pretty interesting. Like I said, observe responsibly. Talked about supposed to be his files supposed to be releasing in 2017 so we're gonna i'm just curious if it is it gonna be open to the public something to look at you know just um allegations i would say hearsay you know it depends how you look at it but if it comes out don't be surprised all right so yeah and um one thing i always tell people about civil rights and natural born rights because um a lot of folks you know they try to say oh they're violating my civil rights i'm like actually your rights are natural born i'm gonna read a couple of definitions on here about these things it'll be under uh the legal dictionary.org i think it's called lawdictionary.org excuse me and um tell you what the difference between civil and natural you guys can look this up yourselves it's not that uh, difficult so I'm just, let's decide to wing it here got some stuff I'm gonna be talking about you know good and bad but not out of fear but rather awareness of people hear my show enough times you understand my um, my agenda my program it's not the uh, take over and say I'm the best radio guy out, out there now nah, just give you a little food for thought and you can share it share information even your comments too I'll uh, give you all that after the show yeah I'm just uh, mellowed out here been uh, working past couple of days I uh, like not I didn't sleep good like uh, Thursday so slept good yesterday which is nice so um yeah man just sitting here about civil rights it's interesting you know what, is, what are civil rights? What is civil rights? All right, come on. What is, get down here. What is civil rights? According to the law dictionary, these are rights that are granted to every citizen of the United States and by the Constitution, all of its amendments. Equal protection is guaranteed of everyone regardless of race, color, and creed. This interesting thing about, the, about civil rights here. Guaranteed in the Constitution. So it's like... Okay. How about natural rights? Let's just see what that has to say. Sometimes civil rights is, is granted by the government too, so that's how they propose that. And of course, you know, natural rights, you were born with them. So that's what I always tell folks. I don't believe in civil rights respectively, respectfully. I always endorse natural born rights because we were all born to be free and of course they want to program condition us like Pablo's dogs and later on when you become like-minded and observant and questioning you deprogram yourself or break that down break it out so what is natural rights find out here what is natural rights or natural law we'll just hit that why not It's from the Law Dictionary again. dot org. Pretty slow right now. Hey, I'm at a CJ's Java Lounge located at 400 Southwest First Avenue. It's along the New River, right next to the Andrew Avenue's bridge, and across the street you can go to the Briney's Riverfront Pub and Grill. Good place. Is um got some good food there. Good vibe. They do karaoke and all that. I know St. Patrick's Day is gonna be really insane and like it says here 
a rule of conduct arising out of the natural decision, natural relations of so, of human beings established by the creator and existing prior to any positive perspective, percept. That's from the Webster Dictionary here. So, um, yeah, I'm just like doing my little rant. And, of course, you know, you got some people want to go after Trump on, on, on the whole during Martin Luther King, King Day weekend. They say, well, Jim Lewis, John James Lewis, Congressman Lewis was arrested like 45 times. And while Donald Trump dodged the draft, this and that. And I'm like, you know, here's the thing about the draft. It was ruled unconstitutional under, under involuntary servitude. When Lincoln, when that truth of the matter is, when that got passed during the Lincoln administration, all right, that included draft rights, the, the right, the draft that happened in with the during the during the war between the states, and um, that's what can kind of be occurring, I'm just, and that's all you know. I have to I have to look at. So um, I'm just, you know, just just um, going out and. We talked about the whole thing with um, the three hundred dollars and all that. Gangs of New York portrayed a good movie on it, so um, you should check that out. That's, that's why the Thirteenth Amendment, hey, involuntary servitude. So that's how you gotta see it. And um, exactly, I okay, can't. My man Pat. Hey Pat, what's up? <laughs> Just checking in here. Yeah, exactly. All right, cool. We'll be back here. I'm back. But, um, yeah, so, you know, well, speaking of Donald Trump, of course, the Trump, anti-Trump fetish, conti- Trump-hating fetish continues. So, let's go check this out here from consortiumnews.com. And, um, actually, I got this original from 21st Century Wire. Good, good site, man. You should check it out. Good stuff. And this one here is called The Scheme to Take Down Trump. And it's exclusive. The U.S. intelligence community's unprecedented assault on an oncoming U.S. president now, including spreading salacious rumors, raises questions about how long Trump can hold the White House, says Daniel Lazari. Exactly. It's this whole Trump fetish. Yeah, we gotta get rid of him. If we if we don't, the whole country will be in shambles. And, and even if the economy collapses, we're all gonna go after him. If you fall for it, my friends, then, without any merit, even even it could be rumored. Then you're still then you make a fool out of yourselves, okay? But you know what? I'm not gonna be ranting. I'm gonna start right here. It says here is a military coup in the works, or the U.S. intelligence agencies laying the political groundwork for forcing Donald Trump for the presidency because they can't abide his rejection of a new cold war with Russia. Not long ago, even as such questions would have marked one as a sort of paranoid nut who believes that lizard people run the government, but no longer. Thanks to the now notorious 35-page dossier dossier concerning Donald Trump's alleged sexual improprieties in a Moscow luxury hotel, it's clear that strange maneuverings are underway in Washington and that no one is quite sure how they will end. Direct, Director of Intelligence, Dame, National Intelligence James Clapper, added to the mystery Wednesday evening by releasing a 200-word statement to the effect that he was shocked, shocked that the Dodger, those here, had found it, its way into the press. Such leaks, the statement said, are extremely corrosive and damaging to our national security. Clapper added that this document is not a U.S. intelligence community product and that I don't believe the leaks came from within the IC. The IC has not made any judgment that the information of this, in this document is reliable and we did not rely upon it in a, in a way for our conclusions. However, part of our obligation is to ensure that policymakers are provided with the fullest possible picture of any matter matters that might affect national security rather than vouching for Dodger's content. In other words, all Clapper says he he did was inform Trump that it was making the rounds in Washington and that he should know what it said and that he thus couldn't have been more horrified than when BuzzFeed posted all 35 pages on his website. But it doesn't make sense. As the New York Times noted, putting the summary in a report 
that went to multiple people in Congress and the executive branch made it very clear that it would be leaked. Emphasis in the or original. So even if the intelligence community didn't leak the Dodger itself, it distributed it knowing that someone else would. Then there is the Guardian, second to none, and is loathing for Trump and Vladimir Putin and hence intent on giving the Dodger the best possible spin. It printed in quasi-defense, not of the memo itself, but of the man who wrote it. Christopher Steele, an MI6 officer who now heads his own private intelligence firm, a sober, cautious, and meticulous professional with a formidable record, is how the Guardian described him. Then it quoted an unnamed ex-foreign office, foreign office official on the subject of Steele's credibility. The idea his work is fake or a cowboy operation is false, completely untrue. Chris is an experienced and highly regarded professional. He is not the sort of person who simply pass on gossip. If he puts something in a report, he believes there's sufficient credibility in it to be worth considering. Chris is a very straight guy. He could not have survived in the job if he was in if was in if he had prone to flights of fancy of doing things in a ill considered way. In other words, Steve, Steve Steele is a straight shooter, so it's worth paying attention to what he has to say. Or so the Guardian assures us. That is the way the CIA and FBI, not to mention the British government, regarded him, too. It adds, so presumably Clapper felt the same way. What is afoot? So, what does it all mean? Simply, the U.S. intelligence agency believed that the Dodger came from a reliable source and that, as a consequence, there was a significant possibility that Trump was a Siberian candidate. At Times columnist Paul Krugman, Krugman once described him. They, therefore, sent out multiple copies of, two, of a two-page summary on the assumption that at least one would find its way to the press. Even the Clapper and company took no position concerning the Dodgers' contents. They knew that preparing and distributing such a summary amounted to a tactic endorsement. They also knew presumably that it would provide editors with an excuse to go public if the CIA, FBI, and National Security Agency feel that Steele's findings are worthy of attention, then why shouldn't the average reader have an opportunity to examine them as well? How did Clapper accept, expect Trump to respond when presented with allegations that he was vulnerable to Russian blackmail and potentially under the Kremlin's thumb? Did he expect to ha him to hang his head in shame, break into great racking sobs, and admit that it was all true? If so, did Clapper then plan to place a a comforting hand on Trump's shoulder and suggest gently but firmly that it was time to step aside and follow, allow a trusted insult like Mike Pence to take in reins? Based on the strum and drang of the last few days, the answer very possibly yes. If so, the gambit failed when Trump, in his usual high voltage manner, denounced that Dozier as fake news and sailed into the intelligence agency for behaving like something out of Nazi Germany. The intelligence communities hope that if that's what they were, were dashed, all of which is thoroughly unprecedented by polit American political standards. After all, this is a country that takes endless pride in the peaceful transfer of power every four years or so. Yet, here was the intelligence community attempting to short-circuit the process by engineering Trump's removal of before he even took office. No witch hunt fetish, right? Yeah. But the Guardian then upped an ante even more by suggesting that the CIA continue with the struggle. Plainly, the Republican congressional leadership has no appetite for the inquiry into Steele's findings. The paper's New York correspondent, Ed Pilkington, wrote, adding, that leaves the intelligence agency. The danger for Trump here is that he has so alienated senior officials not least by liking them to Nazis, that he has hardly earned their loyalty. What was the um, Guardian suggested? That disloyal intelligence agents 
keep on searching regardless. And what if they come up with what they claim is a smoking gun? Explain Pilkington to take a flight of fancy. What if it, i.e. Steele's findings, were substantiated? That would again come down to a question of politics. No U.S. president has been ever forced out of office by impeachment. Richard Nixon resigned before the vote. Andrew Johnson and Bill Clinton were acquitted by the Senate. Any such procedure would have to be prepared and approved by the majority of the House of Representatives and passed to the Senate for a two-thirds majority vote. As Republicans hold the reins in both chambers, it would take an almighty severing of ties between Trump and his own party to even get close to such a place. It's a long shot, but Guardian's recommendation is that rogue agents keep on digging until they strike pay dirt, at which point they should go straight to Congress and persuade, if not pressure, Republican leadership to initiate the process of throwing Trump out of office. This is not the same as sending an armored column to attack Capitol Hill, but it's close. Essentially, the Guardian was calling on the intelligence agencies to assume ultimate responsibility regarding who can sit in the Oval Office or not. Well, 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 these people are so effing desperate. My goodness. One man can rule everything. We should all bow down. These guys are menace, yeah? Come on. Shoot. Sometimes it's like the high drama queen syndrome, you know? And you talk about a guy who is not even a Trump supporter, for goodness sakes, my friend. But I do see this witch hunting fetish. They, they're, gonna, they're, the one, they're, they're itching to climax it to the fullest, all right? And it says here, a desperate establishment of all which demonstrates how desperate the military intel- intelligence complex has grown after Clapper's report on the alleged Russian hacking of Democratic emails met with such a derisory reception. Found in its publication on January 6th, even the Times admitted that it provided no new evidence to support assertions that Moscow meddled covertly through hacking and other actions. While the Daily Beast said it was unlikely to convince a single skeptic due to a notable absence of anything by the by way of backing backup data. See, the steel dozier was supposed to take up the slack, yet it has fallen short as well. It asserts, for example, that Trump attorney Michael Cohen traveled to Prague to discuss hacking with a Russian official named Oleg Solodunkin, a, a, a claim that both men have since denied. It misspells the name of a major Russian bank and gets Russian geographic, wrong, geographic, geography wrong, too. As Matthew Owens points out in a very smart article in Newsweek, it seems to be under the impression that the suburb of Barica on the Tony Rubilco Highway, hopefully I pronounced that name correctly, is a closed government compound instead of just an expense, expensive vacation home area favored by the new rich. The Dozier has spelled the name of Azeri real estate mogul named Aras Aglavor, Larove, excuse me, Aglavor, and reports association with Trump as news in August 2016 when Aglavor publicly organized Trump's visit to the Miss Universe pageant in 2013 and arranged a meeting with top Russian businessmen for Trump afterward, both of which were widely reported at the time. Other aspects of the Dozier did, did not add up either. It reports that the Russian government has been cultivating, supporting, and assisting Trump for at least five years in order to encourage splits and divisions in the Russian alliance. But as Matthews point out, points out, Trump wasn't in politics five years ago and was considered a long shot for months after entering the presidential race in mid-2015. So how could the Kremlin be sure that their man would ultimately prevail? The Dozier says Trump accepted a regular flow of intelligence from the Kremlin included on Democratic and other political rivals. But Trump gave no hint of having inside information when He's called for crooked Hillary to be locked up for purging her email files. To the contrary, he did so on the basis of information available on every front page. The memo says that the Russians also had compromising material on Clinton. If so, then why wasn't it used? 
their hearsay evidence. The discrepancies go on, but this is what would expect of a document based entirely of hearsay in which source A claimed to have gotten a juicy tidbit from source B who heard, who heard it from source C deep inside the Kremlin. Grasping a straw, the Guardian's Ed Pinkle Pilkington conceded that no news agency had been able to verify Dodger findings, but he said they are unlikely to be discarded as quickly or as conclusively as Trump would like for the simple reason that the flip side of the information that cannot be classed reliable is that neither can be classed re unreliable. But the same could be said for information that someone got from a friend whose brother-in-law heard from a park ranger that Barack and Michelle like to while away their evenings snorting cocaine. It can't be classed as reliable because no one can verify that it's true. But it can be classed as unreliable because no one can prove that it's wrong. So maybe the best thing to do is to impeach Obama in a few days. He has remaining just to be sure, right? This is not to say that the so-called president-elect's legitimacy is not open to question. The contrary is questionable in the extreme given that he lost a popular election, popular election by more than 2.86 million votes in Democratic country. This should count for something, but the intelligence community is not attacking him on Democratic grounds, needless to say, but not imperial. Trump is a right-wing blowhard whose absurd babbling about Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Yemen revealed a man who is genuinely ignorant about how the world, world works. He has managed to seize on one or two semi-good ideas over the years. One is that Obama's administration's computational policies towards Russia are a recipe for disaster, while another is the toppling Syria's Bashar al-Assad with al-Qaeda and ISIS still up and about only hasting their march on Damascus. Both views are perfectly sensible, but because Washington's endlessly bellicose foreign policy established is wedded to the opposite, it sees them as high treason. Well, I have to agree on that. This is very serious. U.S. foreign policy has been marked by a high degree of continuity since World War II as a Republican Democratic president likely a pledge to uphold the imperial agenda. But Trump, as radical in his ways as William Jennings Bryan was in 1896, or Henry A. Wallace in 1948, is bucking the consensus to the unprecedented degree. Even though its policies have led to disaster after disaster, the foreign policy establishment is egg-hast. Consequently, it is frantically searching for a way to prevent him from carrying his ideas out. The intelligence agencies appear to be running out of time when the inauguration only a few days away, but that doesn't mean they're giving up. All it means, rather, is that they'll go deeper underground. Trump may enter the White House on January 20th, but the big question is how long he'll remain. And of course, so they're going to try to throw so much propaganda against this man. All right, try to get him on anything. And it's really nothing new. One thing about politics is nothing more than a parasitic entity. Very dirty, nefarious, unsanitized. All right. I, 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 I just simplify. I, I just simplify that. What really gets me is I know there's a big protest happening there. But these by communists and so forth. I'm, I want to say this: How many of them will be provocateurs, plants, or agents that are gonna manifest in those causes? The, there will be a bunch of jack lanterns think they're on your side and they're gonna try to burn you. If you're gonna get involved in that, my friends, you better know your surroundings because something like that, they're gonna find out. They're gonna figure out how to burn you. And everything he people he hire, you gotta question, you gotta observe and study their past history. Like Jeff 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 Sessions, Jim, is it Jim Sessions, who like like he's um attorney general now or been proved. He, he still supports victimless crime laws. So you can be so you have those facts, then you go after them. 
with the facts, not hearsay or anything like that. You have to have merit. Like I always tell people, you're going to be critical, have merit instead of being a parent. All right. And so um, I, I, the, I'm going to share a video here on um, it's by uh, Lisa Belvins. That's her name. Oh, Rachel Belvins, excuse me. On, on why the war on drugs will flourish under President Trump. And I can give Ms. Belvin's credit because she has merit. She has actual video evidence and documentation so you can, you, you can, you can read and see for yourselves. So, um, so, like I say, you can actually read these, uh, examine the video, and do your homework. It's plain and simple. That's why, yeah, I'm not going to be jump him for joy and let him do everything. No, every individual, even if you support Donald Trump or not, you got to put his feet to the fire just like the rest of the folks in Congress. And not just on the federal level, all, all of them, state and local too. And anything he signs or anything the House um, supports, which is unconstitutional, we got the Ninth and Tenth Amendments of the U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights. Exercise it. Don't complain. Take action. Even if you're a juror, juror nullification. No victim, no crime, not guilty. The judge don't like it. The prosecutor don't like it. Piss on them. That's how I look at it. You treat them like fire hydrants, like like a dog, like your dog. They're a fire hydrant. You take a leak on them. All right. It's just, a, it's just an example. That's why. And I've seen the video myself, and she said it has some solid points. And that's why, hey, when it comes to government, think of this is what it means in Latin control of the mind. I know I may have harped this a few times, but if people haven't heard me for my first time listening, check it out. Look it up. You won't be disappointed. So that is it about the whole Trump thing. And next one here came from the fightforthefuture.org. Actually, it was on Tumblr. That's some good news. came out um, today. It says here, Boston Scrap Plan to purchase social media surveillance software following public backlash over civil liberties. And it came out on the 14th. It's by um, Evan Greer. And it says here, the Boston Police Department announced yesterday that for now, they will not be moving ahead with their plan to spend $1.4 million on social media monitoring software. The announcement comes amid growing public outcry about the plan which would be given, have given local or police or related capabilities to constantly scan and analyze online speech in the area. There's a huge victory and offers a glimmer of hope for basic rights at a time when it's in short supply, says Evan Greer, campaign director for Fight for the Future, a group that led efforts to oppose the BPD surveillance aspirations. Mass surveillance programs like the one in the, the Boston police attended to launch don't actually make us safer. But they have a profoundly chilling effect on free freedom of speech and our basic civil rights. I'll say this to Mr. Greer. It's our natural rights. I will, and I said that out of respect, okay? <laughs> Last month, a digital, digital, digital rights group, Fight for the Future, and a dozen other civil liberty organizations sent a letter to the mayor and city council calling them to halt the plan in coordination with the Massachusetts chapter of the ACLU. They also collected thousands of signatures on a petition from Bostonians opposed to the deal. Boston Globe issued a misguided endorsement of the BBT plan. Greer wrote a rebuttal, which was widely spread but shared. BBT drew even more criticism on the plan when it has revealed that they had bent the rules in the Boston Trump Trust Act in order to hand over at least nine people to federal immigration officials for deportation, violating the city policy preventing cops from getting involved in immigration enforcement. City governments and law enforcement agencies around the country should take note of what happened here in Boston. The public will not allow them to waste our tax dollars on dangerous tools that won't make us safer, but will enable mass discrimination and violation of our rights, Greer said. And you know what? That's what I say, Boston strong. When the when you when when you got people in the community fight for something that's right. And they say, "What well, government government entities trying to take, or trying to deprive on it?" And you battle it. That's what strength's about. And this is great news, okay? And because anyone can do it. So when I hear people complain, nothing you can do. 
I'd like to tell him to shut the hell up. Because I don't accept any of your candy-ass rhetoric. Anything can achieve can be achieved. George Washington Carver once said, if there is no, no vision, then there is no hope. He was a famous botanist. He's the one who started, who created the um, products made up from peanuts, including soap. Yeah, so all you people that that um that are racist against soap, yep, or against black people, George Washington, make sure you don't use bar of soap made of peanut oil, okay? <laughs> yeah, that's George Washington Carver, and um, great botanist, very brilliant for his time. So that means we have vision, there is hope. So everyone out there. We all have obligations. Petition away. Do things you that will suit you the best. So, um, wherever it is, talking to people, podcasting, even doing a online website. And what's a good thing too about the about these um, sites, social media surveillance sites, that you got some are very privacy friendly too, like Minds.com. And um, I'm trying to other areas. I've seen that life. I, I do have. I do have. Um, um, profiles on there. I know I have uh, sites. Uh, pro- those, I use those pages too. And they're a lot more privacy, pro privacy. So use those, man. Drive these people crazy. Yeah. Just, just drive these this, the system nuts. And um, great victory for Boston. You ha- and if they can do it, so everyone else. All right. Okay. Next one here. Ruji came from um, the anti media. And I uh, got this link from Blacklisted News. Hello there, Mr. Owens, Doug Owens. Hopefully you're doing well, my brother. And your family's is healthy and prosperous as well. Okay. And it says here, this is from the anti-media. It says here, Congressman says, U.S. government is arming ISIS. Introduce the bill to stop it. Nice. Hold on here. Wow, a lot of these delays are happening on my site. Good grief. Come on. Come on. Yeah, so I got to check this tech. I'll be right back. Okay, cool. Got that taken care of. All right, let's check this out. It says here, who, who actually did this article? Ah, no big deal. It's from the any media originally. It says here, Congressman says the U.S. government is arming ISIS to introduce bill to stop arming it. The De- De- Democratic Congressman Tissy Gabbard Gabbard has broken free of the corporate media's narrative by accusing the United States of funding and arming terror groups Al-Qaeda and ISIS. If you or I gave money, weapons to support to Al-Qaeda or ISIS, we'll be, we would be thrown in jail, Gabbard tweeted on Saturday. Most importantly, however, is her introduction of the Stop Arming Terrorist Act, which she presented last Thursday in her presentation in her presentation of the bill, cited prominent publications such as the New York Times and Wall Street Journal to show that the rebels, the U.S. supporting in Syria, are aligned with El Nusra, which is essentially Al Qaeda in Syria. She is co-sponsoring the bill. She is co-sponsoring the, the bill with uh, uh, Representative Tom Miss Massey, who says the bill will prohibit. The U.S. government from using American tax dollars to provide funding, weapons, training, and intelligence support to terrorist groups like Al Qaeda and ISIS, or to countries who are providing direct or indirect support to those same groups. These concerns are not conjectures; they can be verified by one, none other than suspected war criminal Tony Blair, a think tank founded by the former U.K. Prime Minister, released. A release in 2015 that concluded it was ultimately pointless to make a distinction between the various rebel groups on the ground since the majority of these groups share ISIS core belief system and would impose Sharia law if they came into power. The CIA has also been fueling weapons and money through Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Qatar, and others who provide direct or indirect support to groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Gabbard stated on the floor last week, she went into more detail. The CIA has been long supporting the group called Fruzin Al-Haq, providing them with salaries, weapons, and support, including surface-to-air missiles. This group is cooperating with and fighting alongside an Al-Qaeda-affiliated group trying to overthrow the Syrian government. 
The Levant Front is another so-called moderate umbrella group of Syrian opposition fighters. Over the past year, the United States has been working with Turkey to give this group intelligence support and other forms of military assistance. The group has joined with Al-Qaeda's offshoot group in Syria. This madness must end. We must stop arming terrorists. The government must end this, this hypocrisy and abide by the same laws that apply to citizens. Hillary Clinton and Obama administration are well aware of the support the Gulf states have provided to ISIS. The bill will prohibit any federal agency from supporting a terrorist group or funneling support through other countries that directly and or indirectly support terror groups. It is co-sponsored by lawmakers Peter Welsh, Barbara Lee, and Trump ally Dana 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 Rohrbacher. Rohrbacher. And here she explains in detail how the government has funded and trained ISIS and the U.S. agenda against Russia. There's videos on that. And I think this is very good. I'm very pleased she's doing this. And I uh, remember her talking about calling out the, the ones that support ISIS and so forth, which is um, funded by the United States eight U.S. agencies. So, hey. But she has the gut to do it, man. That's a, and she did serve in, I think she did serve in um, Afghanistan, if, if in Iraq, or both. One of those two. I think this is a real good bill, and um, people in the United States need to support her because it doesn't matter what party you in. We're this is a sham. It's, it's true. If we funded, if we funded these individuals, our asses would be thrown in jail. Plain and simple. So they don't, they don't make these imbeciles aren't that special too so support the gabbard and massey's bill all right okay next one here came from truth out this is by chase strangio this here chelsea manning should not die in jail and it's in a, a viewpoint here which is good stuff is on wednesday nbc news reported that president obama had placed chelsea manning on a short list of individuals to whom he is considering granting to clemency Sentenced to serve, to serve 35 years in prison for disclosing information to the news media in 2010, Chelsea has spent almost seven years in custody, a term of incarceration already longer than any individual has ever served for comparable charges in, US, in the United States history. Now, without action by President Obama before he leaves office, and with nearly three decades left of, of her sentence, Chelsea is unlikely to survive to see her freedom. In the past six months alone, Chelsea has twice attempted suicide after she first tried to end her life in July last year. The military responded by bringing administrative charges against her for attempting suicide and then unexpectedly throwing her into solitary confinement before she was able to appeal those charges. A particularly cruel response to her despair, uh, the punishment to stabilize, the, to stabilize her just as she was beginning to recover. In sol solitary, she attempted suicide a second time. Thankfully, when I visited Chelsea in November, she was feeling better. She characteristically, characteristically was more concerned about me than she was about herself. Though we had a limited amount of time for our legal visit, she filed the first hour with questions about my family, my work, and my plans for the holidays. As journalist Glenn Greenwald explained of Chelsea, not only is she an incredibly insightful person, but also an incredibly kind and selfless one. Remarkably, the difficulty of her ordeal over the last several years has only strengthened her character. During that November visit, she made me laugh and gave me hope, even as we sh shared our post-election fears and nightmares. It was a rejuvenating visit, but as always, I worried that our time together would be our last. I have known and represented Chelsea as her attorney for three years. I have grieved losses with her and celebrated wins. I've seen her at the most hopeful and her at her most desperate. One of the most resilient and strongest people I have ever known. Chelsea is still a human being. She could only survive so much. And at 29 years old, she has already endured more than one she'd be expected to encounter in 30 lifetimes. From the brutal conditions of solitary confinement she faced at Quantico before her trial to the ongoing denial on the denial of her health care, Chelsea's incarceration has been marked by mistreatment and abuse. 
As she explained in September, when she began a hunger strike to receive better treatment, I need help. I need help earlier this year. I was driven to suicide by lack of care for my gender dysphoria. Then I have been desperate for. I didn't get any. I still have gotten, haven't gotten any. Indeed, she has been asking for help for so much, long, much longer that before her arrest almost seven years ago, she sent an email to Master Sergeant Paul Atkins, who was in her chain of command with now famous grainy black and white photo of her saying her of her female identity. I thought a career in the military would get rid of it, but it is not going away. It's haunting me more and more as I get older. Now, the consequences of it are dire at a time when it caused when it's causing me great pain in itself. Like so many trans people, Chelsea has had to fight both her inner demons and unforgiving and unaccepting world just to be herself. She has survived homelessness, abuse, don't ask, don't tell, the ban on open transgender service, and almost seven years in military prison. So the military has made assurance that her medical treatment will continue to, pro to progress. With the new administration coming to power, everything is in jeopardy. Her life is in jeopardy, and President Obama has one week to save her. With news that he is seriously considering her application for clemency, Chelsea and those who love her can't help but a feel a glimmer of hope. And now, if no action is taken and Chelsea is condemned yet again to this relentless nightmare, it will be such so much worse because hope was let in for this short, fleeting time. I cannot fathom the loneliness and despair if she could feel if January 20th comes and all Chelsea has before are 30 years more in prison. Leonardworth, Kansas is hauntingly beautiful. I observed that for all visit last August. But the behind the cornfields and the and train tracks sit our most effective mechanisms of death. Our captives can't take it. That can take in that beauty and are instead served only rules designed to break them. Sometimes we explicitly sentence people to death. Other times we are mass, merely passively accept a death sentence by suicide, by abuse, by the slow administrative neglect of our car carceral systems as many of us fear what the coming days and years will bring many more have always known fear the fear of criminal legal systems descended from chattel slavery designed to maintain and ensure white supremacy and ever growing to carry out that aim these systems lock uh, lock away so many beautiful souls who have friends and loved ones and whole communities climb at the walls to set them free in the coming weeks before he leaves office, President Obama is expected to use his presidential power to grant commutations and pardons to set people to set people free and restore their rights. He has the power to save lives with the stroke of a pen. He has the power to condemn them to death with inaction. On his desk sits the stories, dreams, and futures of so many beloved siblings and parents and grandparents and friends and spouses and heroes. The people we lock away are not monsters. They are human beings. They deserve a chance to be free. By this time next week, we'll be ushering in a new paradigm. As scary as the future is for me, I cannot fathom how scary it feels to Chelsea. For now, I just pray that President Obama saves her life. He is likely the only one who can. I can say this. I'm not, to me, the whole white supremacy rhetoric is out the window. All right. And about President Obama and even the new administration coming in, you still got to plug away regardless because there's other whistleblowers out there, including Chelsea, are being shafted and having, or being unheard. I believe. Chelsea Manning should be released because that person did the right thing, letting the world know what is going on and got condemned for it. 
And that is unacceptable. Plain and simple. Why? Because he put a report about how the United States was, was how the United States Empire is killing innocent people. Yeah, I had the right to know that too. I was against the damn war, period. Because it has no merit. Hey, Dad, I was here last night late. Yep. So. So that's. What... Yeah. I'll be back. So that's how I observe it. The whistleblowers, doesn't matter what um, entity, and even investigators are all being condemned. And everyone worried about Trump going in. You know what? It's always going to be a battle when it comes to government. We're going to keep on plugging away and, 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 and expose these bastards for who they are. When they, when they, when they condemn people for blowing the whistle and looking out the, for the Americans' best people, those individuals, they're your enemies. They don't give a damn about you, your families, including your own av petty adversaries. Well, like I tell everybody, support the cause. Let Chelsea Manning go. Period. All right. Next one here came from antiwar.com. It's by Jason Ditz. And it says here, Rurus claims secret list blames Assad for chemical attacks. And it says here, Rudis is claiming tonight to have been seen identified and apparently secret list. A Syrian government figure is accused of being involved in chemical weapons attack tax, and that is the list including some the name of Syrian President Bashar al Assad under the present circle section. Rudis does not directly identify the source of the list, but repeatedly makes mention of the international investigators and in the articles heavily reference the joint investigative mechanism, a combined with the or JIM. Or Jim, a combined inquiry of the United Nations and the Organization for the Prohibition of, of Chemical Weapons. This appears meant to infer that this is the source of the list, except it is apparently is not, as Jim Head Virginia Gamba is quoted later in the same words report and insisting that Jim has not ever complied to any sort of listing names of individuals as part of the inquiry, nor is even considering making such lists in the future. This must then raise questions of though of whose list this actually is where it comes from and whether indeed it is even a real list representing the results of some real investigatory body or simply a list of top ranking Syrian officials as rather as tra transparent attempt to get talks of Syrians long ago abandoned chemical weapons program going again huh so allegations go on right absolutely well we may we, go, we, gotta get, we need to get the hell out of Syria. Let the Syrian people decide who they want in there. Okay, so I know the chemical weapons is a lot of questions, but remember it was proven that um, it was an inside job from other folks. So that was against Assad. All right, well, that's enough of that. Finally, let's, got, let's check this out today by Dane Wiley. AI takeover insurance firms replaced... Places workers with artificial intelligence set to increase productivity by 30%. This month, an insurance firm in Japan will be replacing more than 30 employees in the workforce with artificial intelligence. Fakaku Mutual Life Insurance is to set to implement the robotic replacements with a cost of 20, 200 million yen, more than 1.7 million U.S. dollars by the end of the month. They estimate that they will have a 140 million yen savings per year using the artificial intelligence program. It can calculate payments be made to clients 3% faster than its human counterparts. Although the speed and efficiency will rise exponentially using AI, nothing can replace the warmth and compassion that can only come from having a human being on the other side of the desk. For those 34 employees, many people worldwide, this is not seen as a good thing. Nobody wants to be obsolete by robotic technology as and as we advance at such a fast pace this will become more common than we would like according to numura research institute and a report done in 2015 nearly half of the jobs in japan could be taken over by artificial intelligence by 2035. this does not bode well for the future employment prospects for today's youth Next month, the Japanese economy, trade, and industry ministry is looking to introduce AI to, on a trial basis to assist civil servants 
and drafting answers for ministers during the preliminary sessions and cabinet meetings. Oh, that could be manipulated pretty damn easy, huh? They are hoping to use this to relieve the push punishing hours and bureaucrats spend preparing written answers for ministers. Again, while this could potentially help relieve the large workload, where is the evidence of accuracy and translation from human to artificial intelligence, many errors could go without being caught by removing humans from the equation, leading to potentially disastrous results. As of right now, they are planning to you only use them to pull record, pull up recorded data to use as debating points according to past discussions of the same topics in a report to the Guardian. AI is not good at answering the type of questions that require the ability to grasp meanings across a broad spectrum. Mariko Are, a professor of the National Institute of Informatics, told Kyoto News Agency. As a robotic age looms before us, what does this have in store for us as humans moving into the future? When we, will we become obsolete in the field of our studies or we will grow even more advanced with the additional time we are afforded? Only time will tell. And you got a few sources in there to check it out yourself. Guardian.com, nextweb.com, and reform.org. Yeah. I'm not really too keen with this. I'd rather talk to you mean being in a robot. No, and um, uh, it reminds me of that movie, Blade Runner. Harrison Ford was in it. Good movie. You haven't seen it yet. Real good, real good uh, classic about the androids and so forth cyborgs i think i'm not too keen with because um about it because anyone can advance themselves more diligently and of course the stress level within the government you know what stop running a muck and keep it simple stupid that's how it should be done remember you got the vampire human vampires out there want to push things their way and, and make these little let's legislate some BS laws to benefit themselves. But with the insurance firm, on the other hand, human talk to a human being be more comfortable. If you talk to a robot, I, I find that pretty damn boring. Too much automation. Not wrong. Not wrong with it with automation, but, but um, I find it unnecessary in my personal view. So, and one day, if e, e, if EMP comes out. It can backfire as well with them. So, uh, gotta look at all sides, right? That's right. All right, my friends, that is all for now. I'd like to thank everyone for listening to this episode. Plus, feel free to download and share throughout your social media networks. If you have any questions, comments, or you're going to send me something that's interesting that I'm having tried out, that'd be great. Whatever you do, please have your correspondences addressed with the quorum. You can hit me on Facebook, Twitter, Google, Spreaker, iHeartRadio. Tumblr, YouTube, Freedoms Network, Scene.life, and Minds.com. Or you can email me at LokiLuck3, which is LokiLuck3, at number three, at gmail.com. All right, folks. I hope you have a great weekend. I may do a show tomorrow. I'm not so sure. I'm in a TBA mode. That's just how I am, all right? <laughs> or maybe, you know, maybe Monday. I'll see what happens. All right. Once again, thank you for your time. Plus, always remember that the maniac resistance is healthy for the soul and can liberate humanity. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Keep on spreading the love and may your guardian spirits be with you.